All right, our next speaker here is our next featured speaker is Dr. Sebastian Gorka. I don't think he needs an introduction to anybody in this room, right? I mean, it, but I'll, I'll share just, uh, just, just a few facts, a few highlights. So he was born in London, October 22, 1970. His, his parents fled Hungary for the UK during the 1956 Soviet invasion of, of, of Hungary. In the 1990s, he attended college in Britain, served in the military there. In 2007, he earned his PhD in Budapest. He went on to teach at Georgetown National Defense University. And one of my favorite places, the Institute of World Politics, uh, is John Lenchowski and IWP. Any of those folks here? If you are, stand up. I love, love IWP. Thank you for all you do. In 2017, he became President Donald Trump's deputy assistant to the president. On radio, he's the host of America First with Sebastian Gorka, which you can catch every day, Salem Radio Network from, from 3 to 6 p.m., broadcast all around the country. And on television, he's the host of the Sunday evening show, The Gorka Reality Check on Newsmax TV. Our Newsmax friends, put your hands up. Is it John Gizzi? He's here and others. Anybody from Newsmax? So without uh, further ado, again, he doesn't need any introduction. Here is uh, Sebastian Gorka. Why is there a knife here? <laughs> What's that for? I don't know. That's uh, interesting. Interesting. I think, you know, we have some intelligence about something that's going to happen later. All right, uh, it's a distinct honor to be here tonight. When I was first approached not too long ago to be your keynote, I thought, wow, who's done that before? Huh, Newt Gingrich, Justice Antonin Scalia. You can tell me later, Paul, who canceled, but I'm, I'm delighted to be here, um, to be in this uh, august list of keynote speakers for an amazing cultural influence that is The Spectator. For those of you who do not know who I am, uh, more than simply the guy who has a funny accent on radio and TV and likes to get in fights in the Rose Garden, um, let's just talk a little bit about how I ended up in the White House and then what we face as patriots together in the next 13 months in this, the greatest nation on God's green earth. As you can tell from my deep Alabamian drawl, I was not born here. As Paul said, I was born in the UK to parents who escaped Hungary. My father actually escaped a communist political prison in which he had been given a life sentence at the age of 20 for being an anti-communist after he had been betrayed by Kim Philby. They escaped to the West, my father and his future wife, the 17-year-old daughter of a fellow prisoner, and ended up in the UK, where I was born and raised, served some time in the Territorial Army, and then served in Hungary after the fall of the Berlin Wall in their first freely elected conservative administration in the Defense Ministry. After that, I ended up doing some counterterrorism work, teaching for the Pentagon in Germany, and then teaching here in America for the US military that I love so dearly and which is being dismantled before our very eyes. In the summer of 2015, I was teaching irregular warfare at Quantico at the Marine Corps University. And I had not long published this book. It's my first book, Defeating Jihad. And somebody, yeah, sadly, more relevant than ever. And somebody had given it to a, a chap called Corey Lewandowski, who called me up in my office at Quantico. I had no idea who Corey was. And Corey said, Mr. Trump is preparing for the fall national security GOP primary debate. And he would like somebody to prepare him for that debate. Would you be interested in meeting him? For a man who grew up in England, 14 years with the Benedictines, 
then college with the Jesuits, the old school Jesuits, <laughs> was in the British Army, in the debate club at school. I had to think twice about the Donald Trump I knew from television. Do I really want to meet that guy? I said, what the hell? So I got on the commuter train to New York, went to Trump Tower, sat down with the man who would become our president, and had the most incredible conversation I've had on national security probably ever. It was wide ranging from the Civil War to ISIS to nuclear weapons, a man who was clearly interested in the topic and who loved America. And most of all, a man who within 30 seconds of sitting down with him, I knew detested political correctness. Halfway through the meeting, he did a classic Trump. There were only three of us. I was sitting across from his desk, Corey in the corner, and he turned to Corey and he said, I like this guy, let's hire him. <laughs> so I signed an NDA, just like Stormy Daniels. <laughs> this is true, this is true. And I started writing policy papers for the man who would eventually invite me to the White House to be his deputy and his strategist. Only in America, can we just be clear, only in America. I am a legal immigrant to the United States who swore the oath of allegiance in 2012. Five years later, I'm walking around the West Wing on the Saturday after the inauguration picking out my office. That doesn't happen in England. You don't go to the right schools, not happening. If you have the wrong accent in France, you're not going to the Lysee. Only in America. And I still get shivers. I thought I had left that life behind. I, with my friend Chris Plant, um, we have jobs that aren't jobs. Don't tell Salem, I would pay to do my job. As my colleague Dennis Prager says, he's told me this just before I signed my contract with Salem, he said, Seb, do you know what we get paid to do? I don't, Dennis, what do we get paid to do? Tell people what we think for three hours a day and get paid to do it. It's quite a gig. And I love it. I love it. I used to listen to a cheesy little plastic transistor radio under the bed covers in London as an eight-year-old till midnight, till 1 a.m. to talk radio. The idea that I'm on the other side of the speaker blows my mind to this day. But I thought I'd left my old life behind. National security, top secret clearances, counterterrorism, analyzing jihadists. How wrong I was. Israel has experienced an attack that is 3,000 times larger than 9-11. If you look at the fact that this is a nation of 9 million people, the fact that they lost 1,000 civilians so far, makes 9-11 pale by comparison. Can we put that photograph up on the screen, please? I've given one photograph to the AV team. This is Itai and Hadas Berdinchevsky, who lived on a kibbutz. They were 30 years old, and they had 10-month-old twins who were found lying in the blood of their pet, lying in the blood of their parents. And they had been lying in the blood of their parents for 12 hours. We have main theater war in Ukraine. We have a KGB colonel who's invaded another country and who some conservatives side with in this country. 
cretinous imbeciles who think a former KGB colonel who persecuted Christians is now saving Western civilization and oh so Christian. We have babies decapitated. Ben Shapiro today posted a photograph of an incinerated infant. Because people were saying, oh, we don't believe the Israelis. The fact that Israel had to post the pictures today is abhorrent that they had to do that. Because people were saying, oh, we don't believe it. So what does this mean to you and to this nation? The only question that ever matters is, so what? To quote a former revolutionary, what is to be done? Here's my response. We have arrived in a new age of national security. And this time, we have to get it right. The neoconservatism of the Wolfowitzes, of the Fights, is utterly discredited, and with good reason. Let's not forget where they came from. Let's not forget that these cretinous people who thought you could democratize other nations based on tribal cultures at the end of a gun barrel, they started off as Trotskyites. The neoconservatives were born in Trotskyism. Likewise, and if you take this personally, tough. So is the utterly moronic and churlish concept of isolationism and libertarianism. It is dead. The idea that, like Tucker thinks, we can just pull up the, you know, the curtains on the Atlantic and the, the Pacific and we'll be fine. Wake up. Today, the CBP had to admit, Biden's CBP had to admit, we have 5.7 illegal, 5.7 million illegals in America, which is garbage. We've probably got 15 million in the last two and a half years. In the last three months, 150 people on the terror watch list were identified crossing our border. 9-11 was done by 19 people. 19 people with box cutters and mace. And we've got, say, 1%, say, half a percent of the 15 million are jihadis. That's divisional sized forces. That's an army. If you're Hezbollah, if you're Hamas, if you're Al Qaeda, if you're ISIS, of course you're sending your agents across the southern border. So what is our role in the world? And how will we be safe? I'll tell you, my wife and I were trying to come up with some catchy phrase to describe a new philosophy. And I want Paul, and God bless Paul. Paul, it takes courage. It's this stupid I have to say this. But for an academic to come on my show regularly, because I'm, you know, as an old lady at the post office called me, Mr. Maga, right? To have the stones to come on my show means he's a man of courage as well. So thank you, Paul Kengor. <laughs> but I want him and everybody who stood up when they said they've written for The Spectator. I want Bob. I want everybody else to help me and Katie find a, a catchy label for what's going to be the future philosophy of America Strong. We've come up with surgical strength. That was Katie's. I like that. I've come up with surgical might. We can have a vote on it later. But what does it look like? Beyond a catchy phrase, it looks like what President Trump did. And can I say hi to all the people I haven't seen in years who were my colleagues? You know who you are. Derek, Paul, Ira, Chiron. Amanda and the rest. I feel like the band's getting back together. It's good to see you. But can I explain what we need? We need what we did in the White House. President Trump is not an ideologue. He's not a neocon, he's not a neoliberal, he's not an interventionist. But what did he do? Three examples. Number one, 
The most serious I've ever seen President Trump, and I've seen him angry, was when I went into the Oval and it was just the two of us. And he was sitting sideways to the resolute desk with his legs crossed and a huge file of papers on his legs and his reading. And I, I was in there to talk about Iran or something. And he suddenly looked at me. And he must have just got off the phone with Pyongyang or something. And he said, Seb? And he was, he was so serious. He said, I don't want to send GIs to Korea again to die. He said, if I have to, I will, but I really don't want to. But he's not an isolationist. How do we know that? We didn't invade other people's countries and tell them how to live. But when Assad, the murderous Assad, was, this is declassified, I can d discuss it now, was prepping vehicles to launch a second chemical weapon attack in Syria against civilians, women, and children. When we briefed the president, he said, burn it to the ground, and launched 52 cruise missiles. No troops on the ground, but 52 cruise missiles, and destroyed that air base. And then <laughs> he did that while he was having a state dinner at Mar-a-Lago, and then leant over Xi Jinping, over the chocolate cake, and through the interpreter said, um, I just solved the problem in Syria. And he was telling Xi, and he was telling Putin, and he was telling little Kim in North Korea, there are some lines you don't cross, and we will come down on you like the hammers of hell. And the last thing he did, I find it so amusing. Everybody's an expert on the Wagner Group now. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> we knew about the Wagner Group back in the Trump White House. And when the president had been informed by the DOD that 300 Russians were running around the Middle East destabilizing the region, he said, <laughs> we don't need more crap like that in the Middle East. We don't need more wars. So he told the Pentagon, to kill them now. No president since the October Revolution in 1917, not even the great Ronald Reagan, killed 300 soldiers in one day from Russia. No one, except my boss. That's power. That's surgical might. So, wake up America, understand, who the threat is. It's not about the Jews. It's about all the Jews and all the Christians. It's about Western civilization. And I'll leave you on this cheery thought. As the president said, the spectator's good to depress you. The real threat is inside the wire. It's here. When BLM posts pro-Palestinian memes, when the chief of staff of the assistant secretary for special operations is a Hamas plant, they're already here. So stay frosty, my friends. We have, uh, so we have, uh, we have about, we're gonna talk for about you 10. You are gonna just Yeah, just okay. a few how, minutes. How much time you want? About 10 minutes. You got it. Is that okay? All right, very good. All right, thank you. Thanks, Grover. So uh, Hamas has called for a global day of jihad tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I don't know what that's going to mean. I don't know what that's going to entail. Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? And what are your thoughts on Israel? So and <laughs> a lot of go, friends, go, go. Uh, a fireman, a firefighter was texting me over dinner saying, I canceled my flight tomorrow. Yeah. My family said I'm not to travel. Well, I'll be on a plane at 8 o'clock. Because you know what? Um, terrorists don't tell you they're about to attack. Okay? They want you to cancel their plans. They want you to be afraid. So I'm packing heat, but I'm not changing my plans. Okay? Um, something may happen, but don't be paranoid. Have a plan, 
and make sure that what you saw on the videos of armed men going into a kibbutz house, slaughtering everybody inside, make sure you can deal with that. I can deal with that. My family can deal with that. Can you deal with it? Because we must not give in to fear. So Friday, I'm a little bit skeptical, but just be aware of where you're going and what you're doing. Yeah, they're about seven hours ahead of us, by the way. So it's a, you technically already started there, uh, right? Right. So uh, so we'll be we'll be watching. The um, you know you and I frequently talk about the the threat from within, right? So what what really and, and I did your show last week. We did about an hour, kind of struggling to define this. You know, what 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 is the threat from within that we're facing right now in this country? I mean, people will say it's communism, socialism, Frankfurt School. It's this. It's that. I mean, what, how do we even define it? I thought you would have worked that out since last yeah, week. I have not. I, I asked the professor. We literally for an hour on air we struggled. What what is the threat? Is it communist? Is it socialist? Is it the Frankfurt School zombies? <laughs> and, and and it's it's you know, Katie came up with the phrase next gen Marxism. And she has a whole book coming out next year uh, with her colleague Mike Gonzalez on next-gen Marxism in America. But here, and, and again, this is a challenge for all of us, we have to come up with the right label because it's not the deep state. I mean, you know, watch Amanda's film on the deep state and the plot against the president, but it's not the deep state. It's, your, it's the in-your-face, screw you, we're not so deep anymore state, right? When the FBI comes after a pro-life teacher, pro-life preacher because he defended his 12-year-old son from a pro-abortionist lunatic, that's not deep state, that's not spying on the Trump campaign, that's we are the Gestapo and we're coming after you. So this is where we're at. And as Kurt Schlichter, um, Colonel K, K, who's on my show all the time says, the challenge for patriots is what do we do when the institutions themselves do not run by the principles upon which they were founded. The age of Marquis of Queensbury rules is gone, but we cannot sink to their level. I, I get in arguments with conservatives say, whatever it takes. No, I'm not gonna live in that America because that's not America anymore. If I cheat, if I commit crimes, if I tear up the Constitution to win, then there is no America. But we have to identify the nature of the threat, and the threat is our government. And, and, of, and of the type of Marxism, I mean, this, this is an entirely different type of Marxism. I mean, this isn't what your parents fled from the Soviets. I mean, it's not classical Marxism. It's, it's more of a cultural Marxism, even race-based Marxism, gender Marxism. Can I give you some good news? I know it's very un-Hungarian, but let, let me give you some good news. Please. The Frankfurt School scions are dead. The nice thing about the challenge we face is that, and, and you've got to talk to Rich, we've been discussing, we've been grappling with Rich Minotaur on this issue. But the thing about the left is they have no great minds anymore. There are no Marcuses, Adornos, Rudi Deutschkes. They're dead. They're gone. What we see is the, the after effects, the, 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 the resonance of what they created, Gramsci's ghost, if you will. <laughs> and yes, America is indoctrinated. Yes, 60% of millennials would prefer to live in a socialist America. But ask them to define socialism. Ask them to explain what it is and why it's going to work, and they stutter. They have nothing to say. They are indoctrinated, but the depth of indoctrination is like a veneer. It is very thin. So if we can blast through the indoctrination, there is mental material to work with. So it's bad in the extent of the indoctrination, but this isn't the weather underground. Right, right. This isn't Bader Meinhof. This is millions of useful idiots who just need to be ripped out of their torpor. Yeah, I mean, nine out of 10 uh, so self-identified socialists, if you ask them to define socialism, they have no idea what it is. But on the other hand, they are electing the Congress 
Uh, I mean, Cenk Iger said a few years ago of the Young Turks. You mean, you mean the yeah. guy who's running for president, right? Yeah. Is, is he running? Oh, yeah, he's running, but there's only one problem. He wasn't born here. Uh, it's a small, I mean, they're this intelligent. Yeah. Right, he's right, he's right, announced right. he's running for president, but he hasn't read the Constitution. And, and he, he said, we need to elect a, a couple dozen AOCs or Omars, and people will freak the hell out. And right now in Congress, they've got about a dozen former members of the Democratic Socialists of America. And, and if you look at the most obscene comments right now on Hamas and Israel coming from Congress, it's Omar, it's Tlaib, it's, it's people from the Democratic Socialists of America. So, I mean, that is, um, that's an entirely different uh, type of threat from within that's actually getting elected to Congress. Uh, absolutely, and, and this is why the, the Democrat Party will never change from within. I mean, th th they have genuflected at the altar of the radicals. Pelosi did, Schumer did. The only way this ever changes is they are so routed that they are crushed and they then have to pick themselves up, up off the ground. And that's why the next election, you've heard it all your lives. The next election is the most important election of your lifetime. You, well, this time it's actually right. And, and I say to people, if, if my wife can be a chief election officer in our district in Virginia, if she can be organizing door knockers around the whole county, what's your excuse? It's nothing. I mean, here's a shocking statistic from my former colleague at Breitbart. Everybody bitches and moans about the GOP and the rhinos. Of the local GOP positions, and I mean the ones beneath precinct captain, that's a real job. I mean the ones that are maybe two days a week, two, two days a month in real work. More than 45% of those positions across the nation are empty. So you point at that stinking party and you think, but, but hang on a second, it's, it's my party. Where, where am I? Voting every two years and writing a check? That's not going to cut it. So, you know, if we all band together, we can rout them, and we must rout them. You know, I would add here, too, uh, to that question, where, where are you sending your kids to college, right? And um, you were commending me for my courage. I teach at Grove City College. I'm at a safe space. I mean... It doesn't but you're a public figure. Yeah, yeah. No, but 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 it's so where you're sending your kids to, to school is absolutely crucial, and and I wanted to ask you this as well as somebody who comes from a military background. In fact, my um, one of my sons would like to go into the military. I have a student at Grove City College right now who's a freshman who wants to go into the military, but he said it's too woke. He's he's afraid to go into the military right now. What's your advice on that? Wait two years. <laughs> Wait two years. Yeah. Well, it's a shame, isn't it? Uh, it, it, it breaks my heart. I, I used to be a re regular lecturer for the last 12 years at, at Fort Bragg at the JFK Special Warfare School. I'm now persona non grata. Why? Because I worked for a president. I worked for the wrong president. I mean, I, I can't mention names. A friend's son, who's a Green Beret, just came back from training the Baltic states on how to defeat a Russian invasion. He's a Green Beret, and he comes back from Europe on a real mission, and he gets a three-hour lecture on use of pronouns at, at Bragg. Unbelievable. At Bragg. These are the snake eaters. It's out of control. It's sick. It is sick. It's, it's perverse. It's really sick. So wait two years. What happens if... Uh, <laughs> well, it, so what, what are your predictions for 2024? If you had to, uh, what, where do you think this is going to go? I, I don't like, you know, predictions is a mug ga mug's game because nobody gets hell to them. You know, nobody says, you know, two, two years later, hey, Gorka, you said that two years ago. Um, look, it, it was what Bob said. I mean, it's his. I mean, he is, he is the nominee. That goes without saying. I mean, we've never been in a position 14, 14 months out... His nearest rival is in single digits. Single digits? That's just unheard of. Now, what happens after that? Uh, you know, <laughs> we have to make it as hard as possible for them to steal it. Number one. Num number two, these people aren't logical. And that's what frightens me the most. Because look at the last six months. What happened every time they indicted my, my former boss? Popularity increased, and he made a lot of money in donations. When you do that twice, and you're smart, you say, 
ah, probably shouldn't do it again. But then they do it a fourth time. And then they do it a fifth time. These people are dumb. They're dangerous and they're ideological, but they're also stupid. When you have the likes of Dan Bongino, a former Secret Service agent, and you know, Alan Dershowitz on my show, no you know, MAGA voter, both talk about the likelihood that President Trump will be assassinated, you have to stop and you know, just look what happened to Justice Kavanaugh. A man travels the country from California with a Glock, with zip ties, with a knife to murder a, a justice and his children and his wife. But for the grace of God, we caught him because he, you know, had a breakdown at the last moment. So I can't predict the future, but here's, here's one thing. Can I give you one tip? If you're talking to other, you know, Republicans who are on, on the fence, there's only one reason to vote for President Trump and support him, and it's the only one that matters, really. Our nation is in peril, in dire peril. This city, the corruption in this city has to be burnt to the ground with a flamethrower. And President Trump is unique out of 330 million people because he's the only person who can only serve one term. Every other presidential candidate, whether it's Haley, whether it's Ron, whether it's Vivek, the second they raise their hand on January the 20th, what will they want to do? Be reelected. Right, but, you know, of course. So they have to play nice. They have to play nice. There's only one person who doesn't have to play nice. You know, what you mentioned there with uh, Justice Kavanaugh, that, that's the threat from within. I mean, that's, Utterly. that's not Hamas terrorism, right? That, that's, that's the threat. And, and, and on this, and another issue, on, on, on 2020, and this is Larry Elder, I stole it from Larry. Don't talk to me about voting machines. Don't talk to me about data farms in Venezuela and CIA raids in Germany. I mean, just, just stop smoking Hunter's crack pipe, okay? I don't need that. I need only one pre proof of evidence, one piece. If everybody has been telling your party for four years that he's a Nazi white supremacist, of course you steal the election. I would hope, I would hope, if I were living in Germany in the 1930s, that I'd steal the election from Hitler. I would hope I would be that patriotic. If you've been told for four years he's a literal Nazi, of course they stole the election. <laughs> what do you expect them to do? Right. Right, right, right. right. You know, um, last, last question here, and we could, we could talk for an, an hour, at least another hour. Uh, so you and I both came of age in, in the Reagan years. And Thatcher was, for me. Yeah, Thatcher for you. And then, in fact, you mentioned surgical strength versus peace through strength. I really like that. Uh, is, you're, and you're somebody who came to this country, who's, you know, whose parents are from Hungary. Is America still a shining city on a hill? It is. It is. It, it truly is. Because, you know, you get out of this city, you get out of New York, you get out of Los Angeles, you get out of, you know, the bi-coastal elite hubs, and there's America, and it's glorious. Every weekend we try and get out of the, you know, the fet fetid, rank, salubrious, you know, insalubrious swamp, and we go to West Virginia. And as you crest the hill from Virginia, literally, as you crest, I'm not joking, you can follow us one weekend. You crest the hill, and there's the state sign. First thing you see as you arrive in West Virginia is this massive flagpole that says, F. Joe Biden. Right. <laughs> people, people get it. Yeah. People get it. Right, right. No, those are on my street. <laughs> uh, well, well, thank you very much. I mean, thank we, you, we Paul, could, for everything. Sebastian Gorka, ladies and gentlemen. And Grover is going to close us out.